Hello, minions. So, very often I'll have people say to me, I want to read more medieval literature, but I don't know how to get into it. Usually this comes from maybe a memory of something that they read when they were in school, or a, more often a reference to something, some work of medieval literature that's referenced in, uh, you know, in a movie or a book, or sometimes even a game, like a video game. There is all sorts of wonderful medieval literature, but it can be hard to find if you don't really know what you're looking for. Uh, because, first of all, if you start looking and you don't really know where to go, you'll often begin by trying to, f by, you often begin finding things which are in dead languages. It doesn't do you any good to find great medieval literature that's in Norman, French, or Latin, or Middle English, or Old English. Maybe Middle English you can work out if you're a native speaker of English. But even then, no matter how delightful it is, it can be hard for a beginner to sort of get into that and see uh, and, and get joy out of it. Which really, I take it for most people who are not reading uh, medieval literature for a class, they want to read it for the enjoyment of it, to, to really uh, indulge themselves in it in some way. Uh, so, I'm continuing my practice of recommending to you books that are a thousand years old uh, or more. Now, in the past, when I've uh, recommended uh, books to you, um, I've often focused on ones that had adventure that uh, one of my students called dude-based adventures. Uh, a lot of uh, Viking things where people will uh, kill monsters and trolls and and bathe in the blood of dragons, uh, like, uh, you know, the sagas of the Volsungs and the Nibelungenlad and, uh, things like that. We'll, we'll, we'll peg someone with a, with a, with a knuckle bone from their meal so hard that they kill them. You know, uh, and if you're the kind of person who likes, uh, you know, Marvel movies, who likes that kind of adventure, who just wants to see two heroes fighting hand and tongs or see, see the hero fighting a kaiju or something, uh, the, a lot of the great Viking sagas uh, are great for you. But what if you're the kind of person who's not interested in that? What if you're the kind of person who's interested in the latest Nicholas Sparks uh, film, who wants your adventure, sure, but you want that adventure really secondary to themes like interpersonal relationships and romance and things like that? Where can you, know, where can you go for this? And so I want to recommend to you uh, the work of a woman by the name of Marie de France. Uh, France, France is spelled like France. And sometimes her work can be a little hard to find because uh, de France is not pop popularly, it is not actually her name. Uh, it is uh, where she says she's from. So very often if you're looking in like an alphabetized list, you need to look under M for Marie sometimes rather than uh, F for, for, for France. Uh, and she wrote about a dozen Breton lays, which I recommend. Now, she was, uh, we don't know a whole lot about her. We have some clues. I don't want to get too much into that. We're talking uh, late 12th century, uh, reign of Henry II uh, time. And one of the things that really makes her lays, uh, lay, by the way, can you spell L-A-I-S or L-A-Y-S? Um, one of the things that makes her lays really uh, accessible is simply the length of them. You're not committing to an unbelievable uh, amount of time as you would with some. So, for example, uh, one writer that I'll often recommend to people who are already kind of into uh, medieval literature, particularly Arthurian romance, is Chrétien de Troyes. But the Chrétien, uh, his works are longer, whereas you're looking at, uh, uh, so, for example, one of the Breton lays uh, is so short, uh, Chevre Foil is so short that I literally read it aloud in class uh, the other day to the entire thing to the class uh, in order to make a point about something. It just wasn't worthwhile to excerpt it because it was so short. It's a, probably 100, 125 lines in length. 
the longest one is Elidu, which is uh, north of a thousand lines. So we're not talking huge epics. So you can get into them and just sort of dip your toe in. You could, you know, read every Breton lay in a, you know, in an hour probably uh, with no trouble. So they're really uh, wonderful and they frequently deal uh, with issues of love and interpersonal relationships. Uh, and they have behind all those, they do have all these themes that people often look for. Uh, themes like uh, magic. Uh, you have people who transform into things. Uh, you have, uh, oh gosh, all sorts of other uh, magical uh, uh, things uh, that will happen uh, in them. And uh, each of these stories then gets at usually some way that a relationship has to come uh, into being. Uh, she likes the tragic relationships where the people either can never truly be together or the only way for them to be together requires some sort of uh, in incredible magical intervention uh, that's going to uh, overcome the normal social norms. Uh, there are some things that, uh, you know, some one thing that you need to understand from the beginning about a lot of medieval literature is the role of adultery in medieval literature. Uh, very often these are adulterous relationships, but rather than looking at the characters and saying, oh, they're bad guys, part of the uh, romantic tension in medieval literature uh, about these kinds of relationships was to say that, well, that adultery means that they can never truly be together. They can never truly be together, which is why so often the adulterous ones end with something that looks like something magical happening to allow the impossible to happen. Because in a culture where you didn't have no-fault divorce or, or really uh, the option for most people to divorce, it would be legal, but uh, just not, not practically possible for most people. Uh, Adultery, you know, they, uh, adultery seemed an impossible thing to get over, and that was really the the value of it from a literary sense, uh, that it increased the suffering uh, in the relationship between the people. So you kind of have to uh, take maybe your 21st century condemnation of adultery and kind of put that to the side and see that that marriage to someone else uh, is... Uh, a barrier to something, though not always in her works. And also, uh, one particular which I have, uh, I always end up recommending uh, nowadays, both because the subject matter has become popular among people who are interested particularly in tween novels, and also every Halloween, uh, it's one I like, is uh, uh, The Bis Claret, uh, The Werewolf. It's a werewolf story about a knight who's a werewolf. Uh, and his relationship with his wife and uh, his relationship to the king and things that happen uh, because of uh, because of that uh, I think you may really uh, enjoy that one I I think that uh, you know uh, if you're interested in just looking at one or two or I guess two or three I would say uh, the Bis Clavret is uh, is one that you don't want to miss uh, Yannick Miloun Long ball. These are ones which are always super popular among people. Uh, so I would really recommend those. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is, oh, oh, sorry, one other thing. Let's talk about the uh, availability of them. Um, you can get, I, I do recommend if you're going to spend money on it for pleasure, I would recommend going to like a Penguin's Classics edition. Uh, mostly because the translation is going to be very accessible. You're not going to get a lot of footnotes because the truth is you don't really need them if you're reading them for pleasure. Uh, you don't need to know all the things that, that maybe I would need to know as a scholar about these things. You just want to enjoy the characters and enjoy what happens. And you can get a Penguin Classic Edition for, uh, I think, like 12 bucks uh, new. And you can get it for, of course, much less if you get it cheaper. Uh, if you get it used, sorry, on like AP books or someplace like that. Also, uh, Project Gutenberg has a free edition that is not badly edited and not badly translated. I think it's pretty readable. 
uh, on Project Gutenberg that you can just download for free and use on uh, your e-reader. Uh, the it's not a complete uh, edition, so some a few of the things that I've mentioned aren't on there. But if you're thinking I don't want to spend any money at first and I don't want to wait for a used book, I want to just right now download something and just start reading. Go to Project Gutenberg. It's under M for Marie, not F for France. Uh, and uh, download and read a couple of them. And if you like them, then, uh, you know, go online and uh, go to the library or go online and get yourself a, a used copy of a really readable edition uh, and uh, wait for that to come. So my recommendation for you today, only about a uh, uh, millennium late, are the lays of Marie de France. So, minions, one last piece of advice. If life gives you lemons, make lemonade. If day turns to night, make poison nightshade to poison and kill all your enemies.